Welcome to the Cybersecurity Inside podcast and our first ever video recording for what that means. On today's program, we'll find out what our guests Rhonda Fox and Monica Mahay have to say about social equity and cybersecurity. Here's your host, Camille Moorhart. Hi, and welcome. We are doing our first What That Means video broadcast podcast on social equity and data protection. And I have two amazing ladies with me here today. As Gretchen said, Rhonda Fox and Monica Mahay. Rhonda is head of social equity policies and engagements at Intel. She's a former U.S. House of Representatives chief of staff and congressional candidate. She founded HBCU House, which is a platform that provides scholarship support that also connects students to career opportunities within emerging technologies and venture capital. She is a self-described policy wonk, passionate about tech diversity, Internet of Things, 5G, artificial intelligence ethics, and autonomous vehicles. And she's a Board of Visitors member for North Carolina A&T State University and a former Ms. UNC Chapel Hill. She has a JD from George Washington University Law School. Welcome, Rhonda. Hi, thank you for having me, Camille. And Monica Mahay is Head of Privacy and Security Legal for Europe, the Middle East, and Africa at Intel, which we may refer to as EMEA in shorthand. And what that means is she heads up an EMEA-wide team of attorneys as part of a global team providing strategic and operational advice across Intel on privacy and security matters. She is the company GDPR expert. And for those of you who need a reminder of what GDPR stands for, it's General Data Protection Regulation for the European Union and the European Economic Area. She has served as a member on the European Advisory Board for the International Association for Privacy Professionals. She's got a keen interest in new technology as well, and her expertise spans data ethics, artificial intelligence, and autonomous vehicles. She's also passionate about diversity and inclusion and is a diversity and inclusion trainer for the department managers and potential managers. So welcome, Monica. Thank you. Thanks. Good to be here. I want to start the conversation talking about social equity, but in the traditional vein of what that means, first I want to ask Rhonda to please try to define what is social equity in under three minutes for us. Yeah, so I think that's a real simple one. Social equity means something different to every person uh, because it's based on your lived experiences and where you are. But the concept of social equity really is how do we all be treated more fairly, more equally? How can we all have a similar experience where we're not determined what our day-to-day is going to be because of what we look like or where we live, what our zip code is? Social equity for me is fairness and it's inclusion, not predicated upon what I look like. That's great. I know we're gonna talk about this intersection of data protection and social equity. So I wanna ask Monica, to define for us data protection in under three minutes. So data protection is a term that's commonly used in Europe and it encompasses both privacy and security. So in simple terms, it's the responsible and accountable use of data that relates to individuals. And it encompasses things like transparency, so people knowing um, what's happening with their data and how it's gonna be used, uh, giving people choices, giving appropriate control to individuals about what happens to their data, and then security, so ensuring that data is properly protected and the standards of protection may differ depending on the sensitivity of the data and also the sensitivity of the use. As well as this, data protection refers to privacy of individuals and ensuring that anything that happens with that data is not excessively intrusive to their private lives. In some countries like the US, the concept of data protection has been split into privacy and security, but the elements remain fairly similar. Very interesting. So let's dive a little deeper. Rhonda, how do you handle this relationship between equity and fairness? For example, I'll just go with something I can think of. Obviously, we've added as a society wheelchair ramps to Mm -hmm. promote or accommodate accessibility um, to people who are in wheelchairs. And I think it's generally accepted that it's okay to add ramps without replacing all stairways. 
Whereas I think we all pretty much agree at this point that separate but equal was a misnomer in education or school systems in America. So how do you deal with this relationship between equity and fairness? Well, I think at its fundamental core, fairness is about equity. You're not going to get to a place of fairness if we're not looking at how can we be more equitable? How can we be more inclusive and have greater equality? The concept of separate but equal is like a discriminatory thought in and of itself. Why on earth would we be separate? And if you are separate, how on earth could you be equal? So I think fairness is at the fundamental root of social equity. And when we don't judge people based off of what they look like, where they live, how much money they have, what education they have, is where you get to fairness. And so they go hand in hand. So in order for us to become more representative or more inclusive, and we, I mean the world, one of the Mm -hmm. things that we do is try to measure how we're doing. And in order to measure, we're then segmenting people into groups that we can measure. So we can say, okay, females or males, how are we representative in the female to male ratio, for example? How are we collectively deciding to group these segments of people? In the United States, we group minority, and then within Mm -hmm. that, we group underrepresented minority. So how do we decide what to categorize or what to track? And do we run any risk when we're segmenting into groups to get better, that we're just increasing segmentation? I think you have to segment the data or segment groups because this is a question that I think a lot of us are having when we look at intersectionality. You can't just say women and men, but you need to go deeper into the data and look at women, Black women, Latinas. You got to get that intersectionality if we're going to get to equity and fairness, because we all have a different experience. We all have a different background. Although I am a woman and I'm proud to be a woman, I'm a black woman. And so that double duality of being a underrepresented demographic, you got to look at that, right? To get me to a level of equity or fairness. And you have to consider that. I think we need to do a better job of clarifying or deciding how do we break out demographics because then you go into accessibility. Uh, You go into a multitude of things and everyone's not similarly situated. So we've got to take people's uniqueness into consideration and take diversity into inclusion and make it more about intersectionality of all of our different complexities to get to a baseline of equity. I think we're all kind of struggling to calibrate that and figure that out. What's the end goal? Is it equality for everybody or is it inclusion of everybody or is it not discrimination against everybody? What are we really trying to get at? I think it's it's a continual evolution. There's not really a right answer to it because you go back to when we first began companies starting to say diversity matters. It was, okay, well, let's make sure that we are hiring certain demographics. Let's make sure that we have an apparatus in place to recruit talent that looks across a whole different spectrum, right? Then we said, you know what? Diversity is not, that's not right. Because just because you have people of color, just because you have women coming in, are they treated the same within the organization? Then we get to this place of inclusion. And so that inclusion would be, you get invited to the same table. Now we're evolving again and saying, okay, well, we looked at diversity. We're still looking at that. We're looking at inclusion to make sure everyone can sit at the same table. But now we're looking at equity. And equity is, can you sit at the same table and have parity of experiences? It's like you get invited to the birthday party. You get to sit at the cool kids table. But then once you're at the cool kids table, can you speak the same? Can you have the same experience? And so it's a continual evolution. The deeper that we go into it, the more that we entrench these values through our different organizations, the more we learn. It's no longer just women and men. It's women, men, black men, black women, Latinx demographics. You know, we, we continue to expand. And I think that's the really good thing about a lot of our organizations that we are always evolving. That DEI is, is an evolution, not just a finite topic. That is very interesting. I want to jump to Monica too and ask about economic equity or tech equity and kind of in today, and you're looking at such a broad swath of the world, really, it almost makes me laugh that you're looking at 
Europe, mm -hmm. which is a multitude of countries, and Africa, which is a multitude of countries, and the Middle East, which is a multitude of countries. And I'm sure they all have different perspectives on privacy and security. But are we seeing now that the tech rich are getting tech richer and the tech poor are getting tech poorer or not improving? Or is tech sort of this great equalizer because for not too much money, everybody or anybody anywhere could connect and have access? Yeah, so I think the idea that technology is a great equalizer is, is clearly a fallacy. And I think the COVID pandemic has really borne that out. Um, look at people that are in households that maybe have three children to homeschool, but they only have access to a single laptop. It's not one of those things that everybody is in the same boat. We're kind of all in the same storm, but we're in different boats. But beyond that, there are a number of countries in the developing world that don't actually have access to the internet or reliable access to the internet. So many of us sit in a position of privilege, myself included, where we've got access to streamed programming. Um, or many of us will sit around, watch Netflix and listen to podcasts and eBooks. And we have access to next day, same day delivery of games, clothes, food, online gaming. And we can call family and friends through a video call and see their faces. But despite all of these advantages, we still suffer from feelings of isolation and mental health issues. But imagine going through the pandemic with no access to the internet or with very limited access to the internet because you can only afford a set data allowance. Then your choices are, you know, do I connect with my family and spend some time with someone so I don't feel so isolated, or do I keep up with my education? So those are choices that are being made in parts of the world right now. But there's still a huge divide in access to technology, and it also is generally worse for women who statistically have 21% less likelihood of owning a mobile phone. They're less likely to have access to the internet. So a 2016 report showed that there was a 350 million person gap between men and women who have access to the internet. And in families and parts of the world where access to technology is more limited, it's more likely that those families would choose continue the education of their sons rather than their daughters. So it's certainly not an equalizer. In some ways, it's exacerbated the gap. Yeah, and I can relate to the privilege that I have because with both of my kids trying to get online and go to school from home, mm -hmm. they each have a computer and we have a printer that they can use. And I had to upgrade my internet access so that we could all do our jobs at the same time. Yeah. Um, you're in the middle of a fellowship. You're actually not working your day job at Intel right now. It's a six-month yeah. fellowship, and it's at the Global Fund for Women. You're studying mm -hmm. tech equity, and I think you just kind of described how tech equity does relate to gender. That's something I was curious about. Is there a difference in cyber privacy and, I guess, I don't even want to say real-world privacy because they mm -hmm. seem to be integrated at this point? Yeah, and I think that's right. I think we've technology seems to be this invisible layer of infrastructure that it exists on top of our day-to-day -day lives and we live within it. And so it's something that touches us all day, every day. And so I don't think there is that separation. Or certainly it's less than it was and it will continue to decrease, I think, this separation between our sort of real world lives and our online digital lives. My son, one third of his entire life at school yeah. has been exclusively online at this point, because he's in third grade. One eighth of his entire life's interaction with other people outside the family has been exclusively online. Mm -hmm. What is happening with people who don't have that kind of access? And how are, how, what do we do? How is that, <laughs> how is the world yeah, and, going to move this forward? Yeah, I mean, predominantly they're falling behind. So the disparities in education, access to education, of catch-up classes and how they're being targeted so there's a lot of discrepancies that exist today and they'll continue and being in this particular situation with the pandemic which is largely unprecedented for many people there wasn't a solution in place a lot of schools didn't have homeschooling options so but my own example we were sent emailed across work to print off and do on paper and submit to the school and eventually there was an online program but again, without the access to the resources, and I know many families actually, you know, we, we consider ourselves quite privileged, but children at my school don't even have a spare laptop, has anyone got an old phone that I can borrow? I need my laptop for work. My partner is studying. They're in the middle of a degree and we have three children. If anyone's got a spare laptop or, or a phone. And so there was sort of a, a lot of sort of community support, 
So we offered to print off work that was needed for people. And I actually went and bought a laptop so that I, we, we needed to upgrade anyway. So I said, okay, I'll give the old laptop to somebody else who might need it. But some countries, like in the UK, for example, there was a homeschool support that was established. So it's a government initiative to provide technology and equipment at low cost to families that need it. So there are some solutions out there. They came a little bit late, I think, in the process. It wasn't something that was considered at the outset to be a problem until it became quite apparent that actually it was something that needs to be looked into more carefully. Hey, Rhonda, Intel recently released a new framework for social equity. Can you just give us a high-level description of how that's laid out? Yeah, and I wanted to answer one thing about tech and is it an equalizer or does it further leave people behind? I think that's the whole reason why we have tech companies leaning into social equity, where we're looking at equity and equality, not just within our own four walls, but external to that. Because we know as we continue with this fourth industrial revolution that we're in, if we don't get this right, we're going to leave people behind that we are not going to be able to close these divides and these gaps. And it's the right thing to do when we lean into social equity, but it's also part of the business imperative as well. Think about the economic divides that we'll create if certain people and all people don't have access to technology. If we're not being cognizant of how we're deploying technologies in a way that don't leave folks behind predicated on where they live or what they look like. And so this is a major inflection point for the tech industry and the tech sector. We've got to double down on our commitment to be responsible, to be inclusive, and to be sustainable because we have no choice but to, because it's the right thing to do, but it's also the business imperative as well. Companies are starting to realize that. We're starting to say that this is the era of corporate purpose, and that era of corporate purpose is about purpose plus profits. And so you're seeing organizations like Intel say, how are we going to work with governments and organizations globally so that we can ensure we're not exacerbating divides with our technology, that we are using our technologies to truly be world-changing and to enrich our lives? So after what we saw last summer, one in the U.S. with massive racial tensions and unrest, but then the global complexities of this pandemic, where you're seeing the urgent need for digital transformation that must be equitable, Intel leaned in and said, we're not standing on the sidelines of all of this. We are going to join the collective fight for equity and equality because one, it matters to our business, and two, it's important for our employees. And so we've identified seven global equity principles that will guide this work with government. We're looking at the digital transformation and going into privacy and cyber. If folks aren't secure, they don't feel like their data is secure, they're not going to use a device. And for an Intel, we make PCs. We understand that a tablet is not a PC. And so we've got to make sure that we're cognizant of students getting access to PCs because that's going to be another divide. So we look at digital equity and we take that very serious. Another one for us is economic equity. And that's a question of our own people. Are we paying people the same? And do we have pay parity internally? But externally, who are we investing in as a company? Are we investing in suppliers who are diverse? Are we supporting women-owned businesses? That's a huge thing that we're looking at. Also for us is the concept of educational equity. Companies have historically looked at collegiate levels, sure that those institutions, because they're the frontline feeders into our organizations are equitable, but now we're going a step further and we're saying, you know what? We're never gonna have equity. We're never gonna have diversity and inclusion goals met internally if we don't go all the way back to the basics. So we're looking at universal pre-K for students, something that we haven't historically done, but we know you're never going to be on the right path to compete for tech opportunities if you're not given education on an equitable level at your earliest point. And so these are part of our principles. These are things that we're talking about. And I'm proud that companies like Intel and others are using their size and scale to push forward issues that matter to their employees and communities. And that's what social equity is to Intel. In theory, this should be handled at the policy level and the law level in countries, I would assume. Are you positing that it's part of corporate responsibility to make that demand or that pull toward or push toward social equity in partnership with government or in spite of government or to lead government? 
Well, you know, here's the thing. Think about it. What we saw last year is there are unfortunately still very discriminatory laws and public policies in place that are having a disproportionate impact on our people. Since our inception uh, over 50 years ago, done social impact initiatives, programs, contributed to various causes. But now's the realization if we're really going to move the ball, we got to bring the public policy advocacy to the table too. We got to look at the policies that are leaving people behind. And it's a collective effort. And so you do have companies across the spectrum saying, oh, we do need to look at the public policy framework. We do need to utilize our resources to advocate for the issues that reflect our values as a company. And so, yeah, you know, CSR is beginning to evolve and continues to evolve. And now folks are looking at the public policy space to it. So I want to jump over just a little bit, Monica, back to kind of your fellowship that you're working on with Tech Equity and the Global Fund for Women. I think you looked a bit into cybersecurity, which Mm -hmm. looking at some of the effects that maybe cross over from the physical world to the cyber world in terms of bullying or other kinds of not positive interactions online. Can you tell us a little bit about what you're finding? A lot of the, I guess, self-education that, that I did prior to coming to Global Fund for Women actually was looking at the experience of women online. There were some reports that were introduced uh, years ago, actually, um, that showed that women were experiencing 100 times more abuse online than men on Twitter. Also, this perception that because something happens online, kind of doesn't matter. You can turn the computer off, that it actually doesn't affect your quote-unquote real life. But actually, the impacts of uh, online abuse are very real. An Amnesty International report that was released, um, I think it was last year or the year before, showed that 23% of women had experienced abuse online at least once. 76% of women changed their behavior as a result of the abuse that they were experiencing online. So it had a silencing effect on women. And 26% of them had received threats of physical or sexual assault. So 67% of those that experienced this type of abuse had feelings of apprehension when thinking about using the internet and social media. So they didn't feel like it was a safe space. And given the access to information, to resources, to support services that are available online, it's important that it's a safe place for women to go to access all of these facilities. A question I want to ask both of you, actually, is I read something recently that suggested enough with talking about women and underrepresented minorities and imposter syndrome and how we need to teach women and teach underrepresented minorities to have confidence and not feel like imposters. And that the problem really we should be looking at is who's setting up the environment that repeatedly causes a scenario where underrepresented groups, which could be women or minorities, feel like they might be an imposter as opposed to not having that feeling (laughs) because they're fully included. And like you said, having the same experience as other people. So can you guys comment on that? Instead of maybe the term imposter, I like to use authenticity. Like, can you show up at work and be your authentic self? Or do you have to code switch so that you can fit the corporate culture. But the question is, who set the corporate culture? We're seeing this evolution heavily in the Black community with hairstyles. People always say, how can I wear my hair? How do I have to wear my hair? What's a professional look? What's not a professional look? I think the problem that we're always going to run into is who built our infrastructure, predominantly white men. So they set the tone and the tenor for what the culture is, for what you can expect. And it's going to hit a point where if we really want to get into equity and equality, we're going to have to knock down some systems in some structures and rebuild so people don't have to do this code switching, if you will, or they're not able to truly be their authentic self. And I think that's going to be the challenge that we face, but that's got to be part of the evolution because I would never fit into the ideal corporate image just based off of the fact when they decided what the corporate image was, people that look like me were not ever considered the corporate image. So that's the challenge we're going to have. I fully agree with everything that Rhonda just said. I think that really hit the nail on the head. The initial study that came up with the idea of the imposter syndrome actually didn't contain a very diverse test group. Although it was female-focused, it was actually white female-focused. So there wasn't much diversity in terms of 
minorities within that group. So the experience of underrepresented minorities or minorities in general, when they're in a corporate environment, wasn't factored in. And so I think it's really important that corporations understand the environment that they're creating and all of the points that Rhonda has raised around moving towards an environment where authenticity and just being yourself and being able to bring every aspect of yourself to work is considered acceptable and if more than that desirable. Thank you both so much for joining me today. I really appreciate your time. And Rhonda, you're in Washington, D.C., and Monica, you're in the U.K., and I'm in the mm-hmm. West Coast of the United States. So we've got a little bit of diversity of time zone on the line here. <laughs> Thank you very much for making the time, and I really appreciate the conversation and your thoughtfulness. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you for having us. Yes. Yeah.